Pittsburgh Steeler fans. Welcome back to another episode of Steeler Stat Geek. This is Deputy Dave, as Jeff likes to call me now for some reason, uh, from BehindTheSteelCurtain.com, coming at you once again on a Tuesday night with, as always, my big brother Rich. Rich, how's it going? Going well. Happy to be here. All right. Going well, going well. You're you're feeling you're feeling the crunch like a lot of people are, where sometimes it's just tough to get stuff. Uh, you needed to replace your headset, and uh, you can't get it, you can't get it ordered. So uh, nope. you're doing a good job making making do. But for those of you here on YouTube that are that can see the screen, you can see that it's not just Rich and I. We also have someone else joining us yet again. We have Kevin Smith, also known as the form the the, the writer formerly known as. Cliff Harris is still a punk. Joining us tonight for a very special topic. How's it going, Kevin? Hey, doing great. I've uh, barricaded myself away from my kids here in the house, so uh, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have a good chat. All right. Well, first things first. For those of you, if you didn't catch it last week, uh, Kevin had had a really nice article about basically life beyond football and everything else going on. And something that you mentioned in that article that I wanted to ask you about, because I know it was, we weren't sure, we didn't know for sure if you'd be able to join us tonight because of the situation with your son. Yeah. Can you give us an update on how everything and how he's doing? So, yeah. So my, my son's a uh, uh, student at George Washington university. He was doing a semester abroad uh, in Botswana. Um, You know, he was recalled like kids all over the planet have been recalled from those programs. And, um, we had a hard time extracting him. Let's put it that way. He, he actually went to the airport on Saturday night uh, and he should be landing at JFK airport uh, any minute now. I mean, he's gone Botswana, two days in the airport in Johannesburg, flew to Dubai, Boston, and now, uh, now New York city. So we're just, we're just happy to get him home. You know, that's going on with, so kid, that's going on with kids all over the country. Um, I work in higher ed and just was trying to help a couple of guys this week. Uh, from the college I work at, they were trying to get to Reunion, which is a small French island off the um, east side of Madagascar. Yeah. I mean, so they, trying to get was, to there? Huh? Or from there? Were they trying to get They're, to there or from there? Well, they were trying to get to there from here. Okay. Wow. So a couple guys played on our basketball help. team, and they, were, they just decided time to get home. So... These are uncharted waters, man. I mean, oh, this yeah. is just, you know, nothing like this in my lifetime. I'm sure same is true for you guys. Yep. Yeah. So th- the great news is when you when I talked to you earlier or, ch- or texted with you earlier is that when you said he was in the country. Yes. Because that was yes. probably the biggest step. Yes. And you're like, well, he's in Boston. I'm like, well, it's a long drive, but worst case scenario, yeah. you go get him from Boston. Yeah, his so, luggage uh, his luggage is in uh, his luggage is in Dubai. That's you know, cool. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if we're going to see that again, but uh, he's here, which is good. Um, if, if, well, if anything was left in Dubai, that's probably um, the the at, at least his luggage didn't show up and not him. That, that, I guess the the opposite of that would be the worst case scenario. He's a so. he's a, he's a twenty one year old dude, so uh, I'm sure his clothes were not in the best of shape after you know two months in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. So, so how long? Just just to just to know how long was he there before he had to come home? He was there two months. Yeah. He had two uh, months. He had, wow. he had two more to go. So. Oh wow. So um, yeah. Well. Uh, we're we're just grateful that uh, that 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 I mean he's part of the BTSC extended family as part of the family, so we're just glad to to, to hear good news like that. So Thank you. before we dive into the topic, let's let's just check in on some news. Thank goodness it's calmed down a little bit. There's been a lot that's happened since Rich and I were on the show last week. Yes, there um, have been. One, one of which is going to be the topic of the show tonight, but various. Various other things. It's funny because I was re-listening to our show from last week today, and it was very odd how some of the uh, some of the stuff we were saying is kind of exactly what happened. Yep. Uh, Rich was saying about you know yet yeah, could could use another um, interior offensive lineman on the team. There it was. If we could get a good I one on the cheap, of, and what did we do? We got a decent guy on the cheap. We got so. yeah, and that's exactly what we said. He's like, I could see Kevin Colbert working a you know trying to find a good deal for a good lineman, and that's exactly what he did. And then I said I felt out of all the players the Steelers still still had from last season that weren't on the team, if they were going to bring back anyone, it was going to be Jordan Dangerfield, and they they re-signed yeah. him to a, a very 
team friendly contract. I I can't say for sure it's the exact minimum of what it would be for someone with his years of service, but uh, it's 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 under a million dollars. So that's good. Um, just to update everyone a little bit because this is the Stat Geek Show when we get geeky and do numbers. Uh, there's been some reports about the Steelers and the salary cap. If you go and check on um, overthecap.com right now, they have the Steelers at almost exactly $10 million under the cap. But what you need to remember is that it doesn't have two things taken into consideration. Uh, the, the contract of Eric Ebron, which we will talk about in a little bit, and the, and the contract from the trade for Chris Wormley. So that's going to be at most $8 million between the two and probably more around six. So they, they're still under the cap, but not by a whole lot. Um, Steelers are looking good when it comes to compensatory draft picks. We still don't know Artie Burns' total uh, for his contract, if it will qualify or not. It's got to be for more than $2.5 million approximately in order to qualify into that. Like uh, Wisniewski's did not. That was a great signing for the Steelers. It wasn't even enough to, to to hurt them in the in the comp pick. But right now, they're set up for for three. They have a net loss of three. So the Steelers could still sign a couple people if they had the money, and the and the right guys come along. Even if they did qualify, they'd still be in line for comp picks for 2021, which is nice. So that's enough of the geeky stuff. We have Kevin here for a reason, because he's got an article coming out tomorrow. Um, it's, it, I really enjoyed it. I, cause I, as the deputy editor, I can go in and read anything anyone's looking on. So we're going to be talking about the, the Steelers newest tight end, uh, Eric Ebron. And now Kevin, why do we have you on here to talk about, uh, Eric Ebron? Uh, yeah, I've, I've been fortunate to get to know Eric, uh, fairly well over the last couple of years. We have a kind of a cool connection. Um, so the high school where I coach, uh, our, we had a guy train uh, our kids for a few years, uh, a guy named John Porter, who's a great trainer. Uh, John's got a bunch of pro clients, uh, and Eric's one of his clients. And so every July for about the last four or five years, Eric and, uh, some guys from the Eagles, uh, Jason Kelsey, Vinny Curry, um, a couple other guys who are out of the league now. Um, they would, they'll come down and, um, and they work out with us, uh, our schools, like, like right when I say right on the beach, I mean, it's right on the beach. Like, uh, like in hurricane Sandy in 2012, we actually had waves rolling into our end zone. I mean, that's how, that's how close we are to the beach. So that Eric, okay, will, uh, you're right on the beach. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like it's, it's, it's a uh, East end zone fence parking lot beach, you know? So, um, so they got, they go down on the beach and they do a lot of their training, in the sand. And, um, it's really cool, you know, to, to, uh, have our kids be able to, to work with them. We've done field work with those guys and, uh, and Eric, I mean, he's been great, man. He's been so, uh, uh, accommodating to our kids, he jokes around with them, lets them participate in drill work. Um, you know, just shares his insights with them. So, I mean, it was really cool just to, to see him, uh, sign with the Steelers and, you know, for us to have that connection. That's that's fantastic. I know this was a signing you were hoping that the Steelers would make a while ago, but you didn't know if there was something they'd be able to pull off. Yeah, I mean, you know, regardless of who it was, um, I, I was kind of personally hoping it would be Eric for, for, you know, for the personal connection, but more so because he's the he's the the prototype that I know we've been trying to land for a while. You know, we looked at it back with with Ladarius Green in 2016, and I think that. They see kind of Zach Gentry in that role a little bit. Uh, that athletic, you know, what we sometimes call moves tight end. Uh, other teams, for other teams, a little more physical guys is an H back. But for us, it's a move tight end who can stretch the field vertically. I mean, that's really the big thing, man. If we if we can run more twelve personnel with McDonald as the strong tight end who can set the edge in the you know uh, as a blocker um, and who can run more, a little more of the underneath stuff. We can get him the ball quick. Cause he's a good runner with the ball in his hands and Ebron, uh, you know, kind of to take the top off of coverage, whether that be springing him deep in play action or pulling those backers out of there. So that guys like Juju and Deontay Johnson can operate underneath. Uh, I, I just think he opens up so much of the offense, you know, that, the, that he's a, he's an ingredient we've been missing for a while now. And I think that he's going to make life a lot easier for us on offense. So, so Rich, when you heard about this signing, what was your first thoughts? Um, I thought it was a good signing. Um, didn't didn't blow the bank, but we did have to pay him. You know, had to pay him, but we didn't have to 
overpay. Um, only concern I, I have is health. Uh, as long as he stays on the field, he makes us a much better team. Yeah, I'm, I'm honestly surprised that they got him for the price that they did. I know that he was a name that was that Steelers fans and people in the live chat and people on the website had thrown out that they'd really like to see him. I just never thought that the Steelers could get him, get him for the price they did. Now, when we speak of price, I want to bring this up because part of the reason he's not counting against the Steelers' salary cap right now is he's officially not signed. He has He's committed to the Steelers, but – the reason he's he's technically not signed with the Steelers is because of everything going on with our country and the physical that he needs to have. They are really insisting on this because he he missed the last five games of the season last year uh, due to ankle surgery. So, I mean, most places have him already listed as a Pittsburgh Steeler. It's really just a formality for, for this to go through. Um, it would have to be something really big and shocking to, to make this back off. But because of that, we don't have the financials of this deal. We know it's for two years, $12 million. But until we get the actual breakdown, we don't know how much he counts against the salary cap this year. I have a guess. I've put it out there. I put it in a couple articles and some various places. Uh, No one thinks I'm absolutely crazy. I think just around numbers off that he's going to be about a 1 million base contract for this year. I'm giving him. I'm, I'm assuming they gave him probably like a six million dollar signing bonus. That that means half his that's guaranteed money right there. So out of his twelve million, having six of it guaranteed, give him that signing bonus, um, and then he'd have a five million base for next year, which would put him paid seven this year, paid five next year. But for the salary cap, it would be four this year and eight next year. Now it could be a little bit off. It might not be that much of a signing bonus. They might've bumped that down. It might only be a $4 million signing bonus with a 2 million base and a 6 million. You know what I'm saying? It could be various different numbers, but that's what I'm looking at. And I'm like, if, if that's as low as a $4 million cap hit, that's pretty good for this year. Wouldn't you think so, Kevin, that that, that they got that, that I, I mean, we kept saying on the show a lot, Richard, I would always answer, especially before there was a new CBA, we would say, with, with what money, with what is what money. we kept saying. Because, I mean, the Steelers cleared over $23 million in cap space and restructures that they would have gotten maybe $4 million out of that if the, the 30% rule would have still been in. Because some of these contracts, they couldn't have even renego- renegotiated at all. Or not, re- not renegotiated, restructured. Uh, I'm using the wrong word. Wrong R word. Um So that was our biggest thing is the cap hit. I mean, it's possible that he's only a $4 million cap hit this year. I mean, just, just to estimate it. Did you think that Ebron was a guy that the Steelers could get that would only cost that much towards the cap this year? Uh, I didn't, you know, I kind of, you know, I hoped, uh, but I think a couple (laughs) of things worked in our favor. One um, being, (laughs) you never want to say the coronavirus works in our favor because that's a terrible thing to say. (laughs) Uh, I mean, that could definitely be taken the wrong way. But not being him, not being able to um, have people, you know, check him out in person, probably restricted, you know, the number of, of suitors that he was going to get. I mean, I read something similar about Cam Newton. Um, you know, the Panthers ended up releasing him because they couldn't find a trade partner because yes. people were so worried about his health and not having a chance to see him personally. So that probably worked a little bit in our favor. We we had to have incentivized them, you know, in the in that contract with money up front you know like Mm -hmm. you're saying i mean why would he Mm -hmm. why would he you know accept it if if there wasn't you know an additional carrot because you know teams like the patriots who i mean i just figured he's they're snapping him up because they're you know they love tight ends and they always seem to be able to to bring a guy in who you know maybe has had an issue or two in some other places and um you know get him to you know on their on you know, the patriot way as they call it or whatever i just thought oh he's gonna land there uh because you know they need a shot to their offense so um i don't know you know again i don't know what we incentivized him with but um i'm sure that it was something that was pretty convincing and i think he's obviously smart enough to understand that uh his he was at his best in his career when he played with andrew luck luck has always reminded me of a younger ben roethlisberger i think that there's probably just the opportunity to play with Ben was was enticing for him as well. Yeah, I mean, right now you could say New England could grab him up, but who's going to throw him the ball up there? They don't even know. Yeah. So, um, Rich, any what do you think about the numbers 
The financials. Do you think numbers that sounds are, good? Yeah, numbers are nice. Um, uh, I'd rather, instead of a 4.8, I'd almost like to see it more 5.7 because we could mm-hmm. we could put another million this year. I don't want it to be too big a hit next year, but yeah, we're going to be talking a well, million dollars. <laughs> this has been the year of let's not worry about the hit for next year. I mean, my goodness, right now, Ben Roethlisberger's 41.5 million. And uh, I know people are saying there's going to be a big cap jump next year, but remember, if they add that 17th game next year, every salary is going to base salary is going up by one seventeenth, and that's going to that's going to add up there too. So a lot of different factors. So, so I I think you're exactly right, Kevin, about how believe it or not the way they're having to conduct business right now was helpful because it is hurting those players that there might be injury concerns that that they can't do teams can't be do their due diligence right now about those players and see if they're, if they're injured. And the, I guess the Steelers just kind of more or less took the flyer on it, but he's still got to pass the physical. Uh, but from my understanding is, is that, is that he should be okay. Anything, what, what specifically about his game do you, do you like the most? And what is your biggest concern with Ebron whenever he, of what he brings to the Steelers? Uh, as you know, as to what I like the most is just he, how explosive he is for his size. I mean, He's 6'5", 250. He's every bit of it. Um, but he's not, you know, he's not an inline player. Um, you know, I mean, he, nobody's bringing him anywhere to block. I mean, he's not going to you knock your socks off as a blocker. But a 6'5", 250 guy who will play off the ball is pretty rare. You know, like they'll, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll use him, um, you know, in 12 personnel, two tight end packages as uh, an off the ball guy that they can move around. And uh, like one thing I highlighted in the article that's coming out tomorrow, when he gets a free release off the, off the ball, I mean, you can't cover him down the field. I mean, if he gets a free release and he can, he can get the, those first three, four steps in the ground without contact, and he's going to eat up cushion immediately. And now you're going to get him on a second level, third level with a smaller guy, especially when he gets to those safeties. And he's just a matchup nightmare for teams, you know, like when, when uh, you, you got to be able to contact him at the line of scrimmage. I was, t- I was telling a, in the a little anecdote in the article that I wrote about he was throwing with one of our, our high school quarterbacks one day and, and he was running 15 yard uh, dig patterns, which is just a 15 yard in. And he told our quarterback to take a seven step drop and, and hit him right off the seventh step. And by the time our quarterback got to his seventh step, he was already out of his break and halfway across the middle of the field. And, and he, when he caught the ball, he was all the way over near the opposite hash, and he came back to the, to the huddle, and he told our quarterback, he's like, man, you, you just got me ear by the safety. He was like, you, you better get that out a lot, a lot quicker than that. You know? He's like, he, he, he needs a faster seven steps. Yeah. I mean, what he was saying was like, you know, uh, I'm going to get down the field in a hurry. Um, and, and it gave me an appreciation for how, how fast pro quarterbacks get to the back of their drop. But it also, mm-hmm. just to watch him, you know, gobble up, uh, you know, just taking those big strides and gobbling up yardage. So teams are going to have to get in his face in some way, shape or form. And, and, you know, that creates another problem for defense. If you're, if you got to walk a backer out on him or a safety down to make sure you're jamming him at the line of scrimmage, uh, if you're a zone team, now you're, you know, you're, you got a guy who's going to be late getting into a zone drop, you know, as good as Roethlisberger is at recognizing coverage is he'll, he'll see that stuff and you'll have voided zones and you'll have opportunities now for, for other receivers. So as much as I like him in the offense and what he can do, I like what he will potentially open up for other guys just as much. Yeah, I, I would real quick, I'd I just love wanna... to see Go ahead, I'd love to see him set up in <clears throat> in trip formations. You know, we didn't run a lot of trip formations last year. I'd love to see him outside you know, like they used to do with Heath sometimes, get him out there as part of that bunch and then let guys, you know, cut off and pick guys off each other because you, you got a guy that can move and catch, you know, stretch the field like he can. You don't know where any of those guys are going. Yeah, if you put Ebron, who's 6'5", 250, and Juju, who's a physical guy, yep. in, a, in a bunch with Deontay Johnson, who, as we know, is a quick twitch guy and runs really good routes. Um, you know, now you got all sorts of possibilities for, uh, for free and Johnson up, you know, you, those, those compressed formations are really nice when you have physical guys that you can mix with quick guys. Yep. Yeah. What, what I wanted to do real quick, since we're about the 20 minute mark of the show is just for those people joining late, just to say, for those of you that, that might not have caught the last time he was on, 
this is Kevin Smith. He's a writer for BehindTheSteelCurtain.com. He is the the writer formerly known as Cliff Harris is still a punk. Uh, he was coming in and giving us some some <clears throat> inside information. He actually knows Eric Ebron. He's he's worked out with him. Um, he he sometimes trains with Kevin's players because Kevin's a high school football coach um, in the summer. So he's just giving us some insight there and he's got a great article coming out tomorrow. So you got to make sure you check the website for that article. Um, I, I, what I like is players that you, that can do different things. I like, I like when they, when the, when the Steelers make you think you're going to do one thing and then do something else. And there's, there's a specific play from the year before last that I love to talk about when they had, when they were, they, they used Roosevelt Nix and James Conner and, and they had two tight ends and a B all on the field and they went empty. They went empty set and the way they spread people around and they actually got um, Xavier Grimble wide open with nobody guarding him on, on one side of the field all by himself because they caught him in a bad defense that they couldn't defend it. I like guys like Ebron because although he's not known as a blocker, you can't say that if when he's on the field, they're definitely passing and they're not going to, to run the ball. So once again, man, wouldn't it be nice to see Vance McDonald, Eric Ebron, Derek Watt on the field together. And once again, using it as a, as a passing formation where the team thinks they're going to have to bring in run personnel, yeah. but you can maybe, maybe exploit something that way. I just want to see, I, I look forward to see how they're going to use it. My biggest thing, like I didn't, Brian Anthony Davis is is doing a, an article uh, an article series of grading all the Steelers acquisitions. He asks us for grades. Kevin's been given his grades. I've been given the grades. I didn't. I had one of the lower grades on this one because I think I speak. It. I think this has the potential to be the Steelers' biggest free agent signing. He has great potential to do fantastic things. But that's the same thing we heard. I know some people say that last year about a, a certain wide receiver that came from the Colts. Um, but the other thing is, like you all already mentioned back in 2016, when you sign a tight end for um, $20 million over four years and he plays a total of six games in Ladarius Green, that's still kind of – he was supposed to come in and be that different tight end that Steeler fans were looking for and he and and he just never couldn't he couldn't get on the field he was on pup through through eight weeks of the season, and, and then he couldn't finish the season. So yeah. I don't think there's anything personal about Ebron himself, but you look at it, it's kind of a flashy signing when you think about it, because it's a name people know. But at the same time, they got it. I I still feel for a pretty good price. Yep. But there's a lot of unknowns. One one thing that people have brought up in the past, and I really want to know your thoughts on this, Kevin, is some people have to say there's some character issues there, and he's argumentative and not the best guy in the locker room or anything like that. If there's anybody we can ask that would possibly know about this, other than someone that's in an NFL locker room, you're you're the only person really? I know that could possibly. You're going to ask that, that and not back up and put. Because that's exactly what Wes was asking in the live chat. Was that? I haven't even looked that? at the live chat. I haven't checked it all night. <laughs> Sorry, been keeping an eye on so, it. So, for those of you asking that question, um, Wes, yes, I I'm recognize you. Thing. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wes. All right. So, so is is there any? I mean, do you see any red flags that you've heard of? Or I mean, not even that you have to go from your personal and from you know yeah. your personal contact. Just what are your thoughts on that? On that in general. Sure, sure. I want to make sure I uh, back up and address one of the things that you you just said too about versatility. But mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah, about Eric, I will tell you this, man. He's a goofy guy. Like he's mm -hmm. uh, he's got a he's quirky sense of humor. Like he jokes around a lot. Um, you know, he's like a little bit of a prankster. And I could see how in in a in a, a different in, that's going to depend on the environment that he's in. You know, like mm -hmm. if you're in if you're in a really sort of tight you know, environment where, where it's, uh, it's all business and you got really, really serious guys around you all the time. They could definitely take that the wrong way. Like this guy doesn't care as much. He's, he's kind of happy go lucky. You know, he laughs a lot. He tells a lot of stories. Um, you know, I mean, he definitely wants the ball in his hands. There's no doubt about that. You know, like, I mean, like I said before, man, he, he, he'll be the first to tell you, you know, they're not bringing me here to block. Um, 
But, but I mean, I think he's the sort of guy – I'll be very interested to see how Steelers fans react to him because I'm not saying that Detroit and Indianapolis fans aren't passionate about their football teams, but they're not passionate like Steelers fans. I mean, you know, Steelers fans – treat this like religion so i mean it's it's um and they and they expect our football players to 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 treat it the same way and i'm not saying that that eric doesn't care i'm not saying that at all i'm just saying that he's a guy that uh that likes to have fun and he likes to you know he likes to laugh and he likes to to joke around and 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 when he, if he's playing great that'll never be a problem you know but but i can see how if if he's not then people are going to say oh he's not committed he's not serious this or that so Sometimes you just forget about the personalities that you have to, you know, you're bringing 53 individuals from different backgrounds, culturally, socioeconomically, whatever, into a locker room. That's where I think this is going to really be interesting to see, you know, Mike Tomlin. I think Mike Tomlin's the kind of guy who, you know, can, can get the most out of a guy like Eric Ebron. You know, I think he, he'll know how to handle him. I think that, you know, he'll have a decent idea how to relate. They're actually not that, you know, they're kind of from the same area a little bit. I mean, Ebron's from like Northern North Carolina. Um, so, you know, I can see this as being like a Mike Tomlin taking him under his wing and trying to really kind of, you know, make sure that, that he tightens everything up kind of situation. That's a really good point. That's a very good point about that. So, um, uh, Rich, anything you want to throw in there before good. I circle back to Kevin? Nope. Circle back. Oh, because you you said you wanted to to make sure we you got got to touch on the versatility thing that I brought up. Yeah, uh, you know, one thing about Ladarius Green is this. Granted, yeah, he only played six games, but um, in his six games that he played, Roethlisberger targeted him over six times a game, and he averaged almost seventeen yards a catch in those six games. I mean, McDonald's only been targeted about four times a game, and Jesse James was targeted less than three times a game. I think if you give Ben Roethlisberger a guy who can get vertical then he'll throw him the football. I mean, he he doesn't like to check the ball down. I mean, he, he threw a lot of, you know, that stuff to Le'Veon Bell because Bell was a great receiver. But you don't you, – you, he wants to push the ball down the field or he wants to hit receivers that are on the move. And um, I think he's really going to appreciate having another move tight end like, you know, we thought we all thought we had in, in green. Um, and and in, in terms of that versatility that you were talking about, um, man, t- double tight empty – that is, that's a nightmare of a set for defenses. If you can go mm-hmm. double tight empty, um, and because you're forcing a defense to play too high, they have to play too high, um, mm-hmm. unless they want to go man to man and just bring the house after the quarterback. But Roethlisberger, we know he's good against the, against the blitz. Uh, and if you're going to go too high with with now two tight ends on the field, you got all sorts of matchup problems underneath. Uh, and the other thing you mentioned is is Derek Watt. I mean, I think that's fascinating now to have Watt and Ebron because of the position versatility that that brings. I mean, Watt can play some tight end, and the Chargers actually, you know, they liked him at tight end in the limited snaps that he got there. Kind of like an H-back, right? Yeah, so, I mean, you might see you might see sets where you have McDonald and Watt. You know, McDonald is your strong tight end, and Watt is your fullback, and then Ebron mm-hmm. split wider in the slot with Juju and Johnson, or you know, and that's, boy, you got some – you got some. You got run strength and pass strength on the field at the same time, and that creates problems for defenses. You know they got to make a decision. You can't. You can't defend at all. Exactly like last year. Every time we saw seventy-two eligible, we knew that there was a ninety-eight percent chance they were going to be running the ball. So that's just what they did. So hopefully that won't be the case this year. You brought up a really good point, and I didn't even think about that. And you're right because Lad- Ladarius Green had thirty-four targets in his six games. 34 targets in six games. Um, now he had 18 receptions from that, and he only had one touchdown as a stealer. But but that's that's interesting. I, the, some people were questioning because Ebron had a fantastic year in 2018 and then a drop-off in 2019. I have my own theory. I want to ask you guys if you have any thoughts about that before I throw my theory out there. Um, Rich, do you want to do you have anything? Do you know much or, or do you have any thoughts about that first before we let Kevin say anything? Start with Kevin. <laughs> we'll start with Kevin. <laughs> I don't. I don't think he was healthy. I mean, he he didn't mm-hmm. last last year was the first summer in five since he's been a pro. So what's that? Twenty fourteen. So that uh, last year was the first summer he didn't come down to the beach to train with us because he was rehabbing an mm-hmm. injury. So he was so he was rehabbing an injury in the summer, 
which means he probably wasn't quite 100% when the season starts. And then he gets hurt during the year. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, I kind of had a dispute with the Colts about how to handle that going forward. So, you know, I mean, and then obviously with Luck retiring, I mean, when did Luck retire? August? You know, like how much, how yeah. we, we had, you know, we think we had a difficult quarterback situation. I mean, imagine theirs. Now, granted, they had a, they had a more competent backup in Jacoby Brissett. Yes. But it's really hard to, re, you know, like rebuild your offense around the, the next guy on the fly like that so close to the season. I don't know what kind of chemistry Ebron had with Brissett. Maybe it wasn't so great. Uh, combine that with the health issues, and and you know, I think you know, I'm not make, trying to make excuses, but I think at the same time, you can understand a little bit for the drop off. Yep. A- anything you want to throw in, Rich? You're going to reiterate what Wes put in the live uh, chat? <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait a minute. What you put in there, Wes? Um, no. Um, he, uh, I think getting to see Eric. E- the biggest thing I think is going to play a part for Eric Ebron is not just how he is doing health-wise and, and his play on the field, but Ben Roethlisberger's as well. Gotcha. How does Ben come back from you know, his elbow issue? If we get the Ben we're used to and we get you – yeah, know, I'm not so worried. I, I think mm-hmm. I, I think it goes great and ends up being you know a good move for us. Yeah. Um, I do too. I'm not super concerned about the drop off in 2018, and and, and here's I'm why. Not. Here, here's here's the biggest thing. And and Kevin, let's let's see if you can agree with this. Jack Doyle. That's the number one. That's the number one tight end for the Colts. Oh, Jack, 2000, Jack Doyle. Jack, Jack Doyle. Yeah, and in 2018, <laughs> see 2017, Jack Doyle was a Pro Bowler. 2018, Jack Doyle got hurt. He only played in six games. Sure. Forgot about and that's, that. And Eric Ebron had 13 touchdowns, you know, playing in 16 games. So he kind of benefited because, not, I mean, granted, he, when you combine the numbers of Doyle and Ebron in 2018, 2019, 2019's less. I think that has to do a lot, a lot with quarterback play. But in 2018, when you had the good quarterback and he was the option um, more than Doyle, Ebron was the pro bowler. Yeah. But then last year, guess what? Jack Doyle's back plays in all 16 games and Jack Doyle's a pro bowler in 2019 and Ebron saw saw his numbers drop because of injury and because of another tight end. I don't know that people th- realize that so much is that 2018 he kind of exploded but he was the only guy they they had at the time and he had Andrew Luck throwing the ball and you're and he's not having to split it up really between two tight ends it's basically all you. No, no wonder it, he exploded. I don't expect him to have 2018 numbers. I mean, he had 13 touchdowns. The 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 franchise record for touchdowns in a season by a Pittsburgh Steeler tight end is eight by Heath Miller. I mean, you've never seen the Steelers have never seen anywhere close to that um, as touchdowns from a single tight end in a season. So, I I could see. There was some discussion because I I did an article today of okay if the season if if the Steelers could make any more roster moves including the draft who's their starting lineups right now and I listed McDonald and Ebron and I put an asterisk there and it just happened to be on Ebron that I'm like depending on the formation whether it be you have two tight ends or they have three wide receivers because I listed three of them and I listed a fullback it's all going to depend on the the formation of who's on the field. I don't know even between the two tight ends which one I would call a starter because if they're going to start off coming out and trying to run the ball, it's probably going to be McDonald. If they're going to come out on the first play and try to spread it out, it's going to be Ebron. So I don't know that being the starter is that important. No, I don't think so either. It's kind of like sub packages on defense. You can, you can exactly. You can say that we're we're a three four defense and that we have you know Javon Hargrave was a starter or whatever you want to you know who whichever those three to it whatever, but. um, yeah, but I mean, how many snaps do we play in two, four, five personnel? You know, more than more than half. Yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, I think we're going to, you know, have a ton of different personnel packages this year. I think that's one area too where we'll see Matt Canada's value is that he's he's uh, you know renowned for being able to uh, you know be multiple on offense and and uh, mix his guys. Um, so yeah, I, I I think Ebron's got to know too. I mean that he's coming into a situation where he can't, he, he can't expect to get 13 touchdowns, thousand yards. He knows he's going to split time with McDonald. He knows that Juju is going to be, you know, probably the man uh, in terms of most receptions. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, 
if he if he doesn't know that, then he's missing an, uh, uh, you know he's missing the boat. So yeah, I mean he's just he's going to bring something that the Steelers haven't had. So and 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 I, I never even thought about it till you said it that I think Mike Tomlin might be the right head coach for someone like him. I don't think that it's going to be you know too much all serious in business that people might take in the wrong way. I mean, look, the team has Juju Smith-Schuster and Zach Banner. I mean, you could just tell by yeah. those guys' personality that they're goofballs. So he might fit in very well with, with those kind of guys. So anything else you want to – we're, we're going to wrap up this show. We are doing two shows tonight. I don't know that Kevin can stick around. He's got a lot of family stuff going on. We were just glad he could come in for the Ebron talk. We're going to talk more about the rest of the Steelers roster um, in the Q&A show after this. But is there anything you'd like to like to say here to – Kind of sum it all up, Kevin. Well, I'll, I'll just address one more thing. Um, okay, he's going to drop some passes, and behind this, <laughs> behind the yeah. steel curtain is going to go nuts. There's going to be posts galore <laughs> about this dude can't catch. He's a bust. Blah blah blah. But I mean, for what he gives us, uh, and for how he opens up the offense, and again, not just for him. I don't think we're going to be able to evaluate Ebron by his stats alone. I think we're going to be able to evaluate him also based on you know, the opportunities he opens up for other guys, especially in the middle of the field and their, you know, his ability to draw linebackers out of coverage, to pull safeties with them uh, and, and open up space for other guys is going to be huge. Uh, and then the, the area that I really think that, that we'll see him uh, especially valuable is in the red zone. When you start looking at his film uh, and, you know, and, and now the ball's down inside the 10 yard line. I mean, who's covering them? You know, like you, when teams go to the, go to man, to man, if they want to play zone down there, I mean, Ben's great against zone. If they're going to play you man, who's covering them? You know, like you watch yeah. that, that 2018 film and look at how many, he had nine red zone touchdowns that year, you know, led the, led the NFL in red zone touchdowns. And a lot of them were just jump balls because he's six, four and he can jump out of the building. So, um, you know, I mean, as long that's as that a, angle's good. As long as that ankle's good. Yeah. And that's the other thing, man. There's, there's a big asterisk with him. And that's probably why a lot of people, rightly so, are a little skeptical when, you know, when they, when they think about the signing. Because if it's Ladarius Green 2.0, it's going to be a big disappointment. Hey, as long yeah, exactly. as he's, Actually, I, ahead, I hope if he's dropping balls, I hope he's dropping the balls that everybody forgets about because it, there was times where it didn't matter. Catch the big mm-hmm. – you know, show up big in the big spots. If he yep. shows up big in the big spots, I, I can handle a drop here and there. That's the thing nation's going to fall in love with him. Well, yeah, yeah, right. Like McDonald, you look at McDonald. I mean, Ebron's got a career catch percentage of about 62, 63%, and McDonald's is slightly less. He's around 61 something. So they're about the same, right? But, and, and that was the knock on McDonald coming here. Oh, he drops all these balls. But name, name, probably can't do it off the top of your head, but I can't think of, a, a any ball that McDonald dropped in a huge situation that was really costly, you know, like yeah, I can't. Yeah. So here, prime example: Juju Smith-Schuster has two career fumbles. Yeah, yeah, and we but know look we, at where we, they, we know, at, we remember, they were. But we remember them both. Yep. We rem- we remember he's known as a fumbler because of because of the key game changing situations in which they happened. Yep. Um, so that's what that's what Ebron. If he's going to drop passes, and that's exactly what I think Rich is saying. If he's going to drop passes, you can't drop you can't drop the passes like the balls that Juju fumbles. <laughs> you you yeah. you know no one. I, I've even brought it up. If if Juju catch it, if Juju has thirteen more receptions without fumbling a football, he becomes the all time Pittsburgh Steelers least likely to fumble receiver with more than two hundred catches. And he's already got more than 200 catches. He just needs that many more to, to, to break. I think it was Yancey Thigpen who only had two fumbles. So then he would move to more receptions. So he's really good at not fumbling the football. But that, that's not what we remember. And that's a great point about Ebron. I have two quick questions I want to ask you guys. Um, the, let, let's go with this one first. Other than Eric Ebron, if he is just on the field, and like you say, that the safety's having to pay attention to all that other stuff. What other Steeler is going to benefit the most from Ebron being on the field? We'll start with Kevin. I mean, it all depends on how, how they want to use him. But, I, I you know, again, I, I think he benefits those guys that are operating underneath. Is it Deontay Johnson? Uh, is, it, is it in two tight end sets? Is it McDonald? Does McDonald now become mm-hmm. the crosser and the guy who runs those stick routes over the ball? 
Um, I mean, I've always loved Juju as a crosser because he's so big yeah. and he's and he's physical with the football. By the way, that was uh, that was some really uh, next level stat geek stuff on that uh, that stat you just pulled on Juju there. The all time uh, <laughs> that, that, that was pretty good. So uh, <laughs> it's what I do. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. Who, I mean, I don't know who specifically, but I have a feeling where and that where is going to be. You know, just I think okay. we we couldn't throw That's the ball in the middle of the field last year. Our quarterbacks could not read the middle of the field. And uh, and and Ben does it wonderfully, and now Ebron is going to give us more of an opportunity to operate there. All right, Rich, any thoughts on that? Someone who would benefit from him I just think, helping I just out, think, helping take the coverage off of people. I I think just adding another real competent receiver that they've got to worry about in the secondary helps Juju. Yeah, that's who I was thinking right off the bat. But I, I like what Devin Snowden said in the live chat. He's like. How about Ben Roethlisberger? <laughs> Just yeah. having another weapon to throw to. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the obvious answer too. But yeah, um, someone like a Juju or a Deontay Johnson, I, I, I think that's that's really good as long as they scheme it well. As they just got to, it gives you something else to scheme with, and that's what it seems like the Steelers were missing last year. This is the last thing for fun, and that is we're going to grade, we're going to grade this free agent, but we're not going to grade it in the typical way. We're not going to grade it in ABCD. We're not going to grade it in a number. We're going to grade it on a 2019 scale, on a 2019 free agent scale. Is, what do you look for Eric Ebron? Is he a Steven Nelson signing that he comes in and then all of a sudden, wow, he's the man? Is he a Mark Barron signing, which is, hey, someone who came in, you know, filled a role, didn't really need him to move on. You could almost say a Johnny Holton. He, you know, those two are interchangeable. Or is he a Dante Moncrief signing, you know, which is on the like, like even worse than a Ladarius Green that, oh man, we're going to realize right away that this isn't, this isn't right for the Steelers. So that's, that's your, that's your three ways to grade it. What do you think? Uh, I, I, I can't imagine he's going to be a, Mon- a Moncrief signing. Can you? I, I, yeah. I, 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 for his sake, I don't want to imagine that. But um, mm-hmm. I mean, I you know, I think a lot of it depends on his health. You know, if he if he stays mm-hmm. healthy, he could be a Stephen Nelson type guy for for the way that he transforms the offense. You know, if not, I mean, he could be a guy that we say after two years, you know, hey, um, you know, it just didn't work out exactly the way we thought it would, you know. And a lot of that depends on Roethlisberger too. I, I think that those yeah. two are linked, like like Rich said before, you know, they're Roethlisberger's health is probably linked to Ebron's yep. success in many ways. Okay. All right, Rich, what's your grade there? <sighs> well, there, there's two ways you could say this. He's, I, I think he's going to be, you know, a Baron plus or, or a Nelson minus. He's going to be right in mm-hmm. between the two somewhere. Which would be great. Which, which is exactly yeah. what we're looking for. That's what we went out looking for in the signing. We don't need somebody that that blew our socks off as much as Steven Nelson. But I don't want you to become – there were times I felt Barron was out there and doing everything we needed him to, but you didn't notice him a whole lot. I want to mm-hmm. notice Eric Hebron on the field. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a really good way to put it. I, I feel it was a loaded question, and I'm the one who loaded it, so I'm going to give a Dave answer. I think his – I think his floor is is a Mark Barron signing with his ceiling being a Steven Nelson signing. You know, that that he's going to be somewhere in, in between. If he ends up being something like Mark Barron was, it was kind of a stopgap to something else. Um, it's going to be a little bit disappointing. That's that's going to say on the low end, but he could really come out and I, you can't almost say he's a Steven Nelson because you can't say make a name for himself because he made a name for himself in 2018. That's the difference here, and that's why people know him. Where Stephen Nelson, I mean, a lot of Steeler Nation didn't even know who that was when they made that signing. So, I, I think it's there's a big separation there of what it could be. So I'm excited to see how it pans out um, with everything. Kevin, any final thoughts on just life or Steelers or anything in general before we let you go? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm just. Like everybody else, man, I, I don't know what's next. I'm just I'm ready for things to to get back to normal. It may be a little while before that happens. I'm hoping that uh, that this doesn't disrupt, you know, Eric coming down again. And uh, I'd love to have the opportunity to talk to him and uh, 
and really, uh, you know, kind of relay some of his thoughts uh, at, at BTSC and, uh, who knows, man? Maybe we, we can even get him on the podcast. You know, I'm gonna say he's welcome anytime he wants. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. Yeah. If he's in, if he's in the area, if he if he, if he makes it down again this summer, I'll, uh, I'll definitely hit him up about it. Uh, yeah. That, now, does he does he know that you were a Steeler fan or anything like like that? Or? He knows I'm a fan. I actually joked around with him, like, man, when are you going to sign with the Steelers? You know, but like, uh, <laughs> but he has no idea that I can contri- you know, do any of this stuff. So, you, gotcha. you know, I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just the local football coach to him. So, <laughs> you know, gotcha. Gotcha. So, all right, well, we're, we're going to call this a show. Make sure, well, first of all, I got to give the whole spiel. Make sure you stick around. For those of you that are with us live on YouTube, we'll be coming back in about five minutes. Um, definitely Rich and I, I think Kevin's got to step out to some other things. We're going to be talking about um, other other places on the Steelers roster. I know you. some of y'all were talking about that in the live chat. So that'll be coming along um, between five and 10 minutes from now. For those of you listening on podcast form, that that podcast is going to release sometime on Wednesday afternoon. So if you're listening to this one Wednesday morning, uh, this one should be around in the afternoon. Make sure you are checking out BehindTheSteelCurtain.com. Like we said, Kevin's got the great article on a lot of stuff with Ebron coming out tomorrow morning. So make sure you're checking in there, um, getting that Plus, we've got lots of other articles on various different things. We've still got grades. We've got other news, other commentary, uh, all kinds of great stuff at Behind the Steel Curtain. And, of course, we have our family of podcasts that are always coming at you every day. You should see Lance or hear Lance and Jeff tomorrow night live, back with a preview with myself and Brian Anthony Davis and Jeff on Thursday, Lance on his solo show on Friday, then we roll into the weekend with the burning question and the Homer and the hater show with Jeff and Lance. And then we're back, back to Brian and Tony on Monday. All those guys do a great job on all their podcasts. So just make sure that you're always constantly checking in. We really want to thank Kevin for coming out and joining us again. Uh, what was that about? Was that five or six weeks ago you were with us? I, I, I can't, the world has changed so much since then. Yeah, I can't no. even, I, I can't even think about I'll it. I'll say it was about so, five weeks. About yeah. five weeks. All right. So. Well, you let us know. You're welcome anytime you want to come back on. Um, I'm, I really appreciate you stepping in here with us tonight. And we want to thank for all, all of you guys that have, that have tuned in with us to make sure that you continue to tune in, tell a friend, and subscribe. Thanks for geeking out with us. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate it very much.